I was fortunate that the tall man was the only witness to the murders I committed, but on the day I killed the general, there was another witness, and a hostile one. The circumstances of this assassination are unusual, but in Vietnam unusual is usual. Every war has its general pattern. In Vietnam it was the Red Hair Division Commander, Brigadier General George Rusty Gunn. I didn't know him personally. Even in Vietnam, the gulf between general and private is deep. By all accounts, his reputation was known. He commanded a hardened unit, keeping subordinate commanders firmly in line, and he weeded out any dissenters who did not share his brutal actions. A typical example was the swift transfer of Colonel Robert. Rusty Gunn earned his general's star in battle by forcing soldiers to do whatever he wanted. He was fond of saying, you don't have to drive soldiers into battle. You have to lead them. However, having received the rank of general, he chased more and less lead. His division accounted for the most Viet Cong killed in the first quarter of 1969, and it was known in all parts of the active army. Officers envied him and soldiers hated him. The general's methods were ruthless. He abandoned the standard tactic of getting into contact with the enemy and then withdrawing while waiting for artillery and helicopters to chip away at enemy positions. He ordered his units to engage the enemy regardless of the balance of forces and to show that American soldiers were capable of defeating the enemy in close combat without artillery or air support. Only in this way, the general reasoned, it is possible to prevent dispersal and regrouping of the enemy. Only in this way will the American soldier become battle-hardened and confident in his ability to beat the enemy on his territory. This system worked, but it had to be paid for at a high cost. American lives, instead of destroyed companies, new companies were put into combat. Mid-East firefights were fought on a scale unheard of in Vietnam. Whole platoons on both sides were destroyed. During the offensive, the wounded were not evacuated. They suffered or died. That's how the fighting was done. It was a real slaughter. The American losses were great, but the enemy's losses were even greater. General Gunn's favorite pastime was to determine the ratio of losses. Sitting in his headquarters, he would rush his troops and count and count and rush. And as his division moved forward, clearing the terrain of the enemy, no one restrained him. For the first time in the history of this war, an American commander was consistently seizing and holding territory. Isn't that how we operated in World War II? Isn't that the way wars are won? Isn't that the only way? To hell with casualties. If the enemy is stubbornly on the defensive, hit him. If he retreats, pursue and destroy him. Don't give him a chance to clean himself up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. By the time I met General Gunn, there wasn't a soldier in his division who wouldn't willingly take the opportunity to put a live grenade under a general's pillow. But the opportunity to kill a general rarely presents itself. I could not kill General Gunn without sufficient cause. Having read my diary up to this point, you must believe it. Although I have heard all sorts of accounts of the General's cruelty, I have not personally witnessed it. Therefore, when my crew was ordered to fly with the General on an aerial reconnaissance of the Delta battle areas, I considered the assignment normal and safe. Neither, however, proved to be justified. We embarked on the mission on an early April morning, April 20, 1969 to be exact, nine months after my arrival in Vietnam. I recall telling my crew that I had only three months left to serve. They were jealous of me because they had six more to go. It surprised me that I was already a veteran because I had arrived on replenishment when they were already flying together. But I had already had a rough schooling as an infantryman when they were still in flight training in the States. I also recall that distant morning of my first patrol with Blondie and Corporal Dole, Blondie had already served 333 days then and Dole had 200 days and three rivers under his belt. And here I am now 275 days behind Blondie, but ahead of Corporal Dole, who has crossed his last river. At 19, I was already an old man to our helicopter crew, and now I felt the burden of the days ahead and had an agonizing fear. I imagined someone back home in the shelter asking, I wonder what happened to David Glass, and hearing back, don't you know? He died in Vietnam. I desperately wanted to avoid that sad epitaph, and the weight of the remaining 90 days was weighing on me that morning when we flew out to meet General Gunn at his division headquarters. General George Gunn and Colonel Clay were standing on the landing strip when we landed at exactly 8.30. The introduction was brief and formal, and in a few minutes we were in the air again, heading out to reconnoitre the battle areas. From my seat behind the machine gun, 
I could see the general's back sitting by the open door in the overhead compartment. Colonel Clay was seated across from him and obsequiously agreed with every word the general said. From time to time the general would glance at the map spread out in his lap and give Sergeant Bright over the intercom the coordinates of the area he wanted to survey. At each designated point we circled low to the ground while the general scrutinized the area with binoculars. If there was no sign of military activity, we would move on to the next point, crossing over, spreading out below, a serene delta covered with lush greenery. Nothing in this peaceful landscape indicated the presence of war. If people were killing each other in the green rice paddies, separated by brown streaks of water, like the squares of a chessboard, it was not visible to the eye. After a while it began to seem that it was not the fighting that bothered the general, but the lack of it. I don't know how he viewed the situation in this rural area, but I was quite convinced of its peaceful nature. I had no reason to fire a machine gun. I had already hoped that my 276th day in Vietnam would pass without violence, without death. But it wasn't. That lazy day was the day General George Rusty Gunn was killed. We had been in the air for three hours when Sergeant Bright reported to the General that we would soon have to return to base for refueling. That message made the General angry. For the past hour he had complained all the time that there was no sign of battle on the ground. Several times he had bent low over the places he had marked on the map as areas of fighting, but had seen only small groups of our troops spread out in positions where the enemy was supposed to be. If a Charlie was anywhere in the vicinity, it was well camouflaged. One day we spotted a patrol wearily trudging through the tall grass surrounding a hollow. The general radioed him and ordered him to report on the task, he was told that the patrol had been sent to scour a hollow supposedly occupied by the Viet Cong, but they had gone through it and found no sign of Charlie's except a series of abandoned underground passages. The general ordered the patrol to request air power to destroy the underground passages and wall up the lousy gooks lurking in them. Following this, he pointed Sergeant Bright on a course for the base. We'll refuel and find the damn war, even if it takes all day. Sergeant, stay at treetop level. I want to scrutinize the terrain on the way home. Sergeant Bright was descending to a strafing flight, crossing open fields, and climbing up just enough to avoid hitting the trees in the wooded areas. Well done. The general barked into the intercom. Stay low. I could see the general leaning out of the open door, his head swiveling, scanning the ground with binoculars. He was determined to find something by all means, and he did. We had crossed a rice paddy and were beginning to climb up to go around the village, lying ahead when the general's voice crackled through the inter. End. Sir, make a wide left turn back and cross that field again. Same course, same altitude. And anything wrong, sir? Nothing's wrong, sergeant. I just want to take another good look. New gauge is pretty low, sir. How much flight time do you have, sergeant? Ma'am. Fifteen minutes, sir but I don't want to push it to the limit. Hmm. Turn back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Sergeant Bright made a wide arc to the left. We flew over the village. Clearly, Sergeant. When you reach the far end of the rice paddy, hover until I tell you to go forward. Then cross the field smoothly and slowly. Under yes, sir. But if I knew what you were looking for, sir, it might help. I'll tell you when I'm ready, Sergeant. Yes, sir. As we circled the field, I kept my eyes on the general. He was talking to Colonel Clay, but through the whirring of the propellers I couldn't make out what he was saying. However, no matter what the general said, the colonel nodded in agreement. Finally, the general put the binoculars aside, pulled a forty-five caliber pistol from his holster and pointed it at the ground, supporting his right hand with his left for stability. I didn't understand what he was doing, but I was interested. Then he shook his head, slipped the gun into his holster, and asked over the inter. Hmm, Sergeant, is there a rifle on board? Yes, sir. The gunners carry it with them all the time. All right, I need a rifle. You hear that, Glass? Yes, Sergeant. Yes, I'll get up out of your seat and give the General your rifle. Hmm, I'm on it. I took off my headphones, took the rifle, carried it upstairs and handed it to the General. He grabbed it and put it on automatic. It had a full magazine in it. I was about to go back to my seat, but the general ordered me to sit next to him on the bench. Stay here, son, he shouted, covering the roar of the propellers. You don't need a machine gunner for this. I sat down next to him, perplexed as to what the hell he wanted, 
and looked at Colonel Clay sitting across from me, who responded with a half nod and half smile that told me nothing. At the far end of the field, Sergeant Bright dropped to about fifty feet and hovered in the air. All right, Sergeant, said the General. Now when I say go, point the helicopter straight across the field toward the left edge of the village. Go as slowly as you can. Halfway down on the right, you'll see three Viet Cong in the field. Walk so I can get a good shot on them. You got it, Sarge? Without headphones, I couldn't hear the Sergeant's reply, but I could see that it made the General angry. Frowning, he said sharply. Hey, I recognize the Viet Cong at a glance. There's three gooks down there in black pajamas. I don't care if they're planting rice, they won't fool me. Now lie on course and go slow. From my seat I saw Sergeant Bright shake his head. Then he gave full throttle, and we sped forward across the field. At this moment General Gunn raised my rifle and, holding it firmly, pointed it down into the open field. At the first approach from my place at the machine gun, I could see men in the field. As far as I could tell, they were peasants planting rice. They were unarmed and did not even look up when we flew over them. This was typical of the peasants here. They had long ago learned to take war for granted. The Viet Cong would have hid as soon as they spotted the helicopter. The general should have known that. He'd been in Vietnam a lot longer than I had, but he was out for blood. The day was too peaceful for this war lover, and he couldn't let it pass quietly. I read his whole plan in the smug smile on Colonel Clay's face. At that moment I desperately wanted to fail their plan. But how? If I'd been driving the helicopter, I could have swung it to make the general miss. But I knew Sergeant Bright would follow orders. He was better used to the brutality of war than I was. All I could do was, sitting next to General Gunn, watch him watch the field through the scope of my rifle. That's it. Great, the general said cheerfully to himself. I rose from my seat and peered over his shoulder. I saw the rifle barrel turn to the right. Then I saw the peasants ahead, bent over sprouts of rice, their straw hats swaying in the sunlight. We were approaching them at a height of fifty feet. They were not more than sixty feet away. They did not interrupt their work to look up. Stooping far forward through the open door, the general opened fire. He hit the peasants with the first long burst, and all three black figures fell to the ground. The general continued firing until he had emptied his entire magazine. Colonel Clay, who had not taken his eyes off the direction of fire, splashed his hands in jo You hit them, general. General Gunn admired this picture, then turned to the colonel with a face shining with joy. You know, Clay, when I kill gooks, I get a thrill. The colonel laughed. I know what you mean, he said, and covered his groin with his hands. The general, grinning, looked at me over his shoulder and winked. He was still sticking his head out the open door. I looked at him blankly. Then I sidled up to him and shoved him with my right shoulder as hard as I could. General Gunn flew out the open door and disappeared without making a sound. Even now I can see the look of utter amazement on Colonel Clay's face. His jaw dropped from shock. It lasted a second. I cracked him on the nose with my fist, and as his head snapped backward from the blow, I bent down, grabbed his legs at the ankles, and threw him headlong through the open door after the general. It's done. I sat on the bench in complete immobility, in shock, staring dumbly at the square of space where the general and the colonel had disappeared. Then my hands shook, and I clenched them tightly. At last I looked around. Sergeant Bright and the co-pilot were busy at the controls, lifting the helicopter sharply as we went over the village. Behind me on my left sat Jonesy, hunched over a machine gun. Apparently no one had seen what had happened. I stood up. My chest felt like a vise. I returned to my place at the machine gun and put on my earphones. I heard Sergeant Bright's irritated voice. General Gunn. Can you hear me? Answer me? When I didn't get a response. Bright turned around and saw an empty overhead compartment. I didn't wait for the next question. The general's not aboard, I said. Where the hell did he go? Where's the colonel? Ethel, they fell overboard. What are you talking about? How the hell could they fall overboard? He passed over the village and headed north toward the base. The co-pilot was flying the chopper. Sergeant Bright looked out of the cockpit and stared at me. What happened out there, Glass? I didn't see everything. What the hell did you see? My voice sounded worried, but I reasoned that it must be... This. I was looking at the peasants working in the field and the general opened fire on them. Then I saw the general far out the door to see if he had hit. He must have slipped or something. 
I heard him scream and start to fall out of the helicopter. The colonel managed to grab him, but he lost his balance and fell out too. No, Jesus Christ. Holy Mother of God. There was an oppressive silence in the intercom. Despite the wind blowing through the helicopter, I was covered in nervous sweat. Finally, the co-pilot's voice came over the inter... I could hear nothing but the roar of the propellers. What do we do now, Sergeant? Shouldn't we go back and look for them? I don't know. I just don't believe it. Let me think about it. What a story. After a few seconds, Sergeant Bright said, I'm taking over. Let's get back to base. We don't have enough fuel to go back, land, and climb again. There could be Viet Cong down there. Mark the coordinates of this rice paddy and note the time. We are about ten minutes from the division base. We're almost there. We flew in silence for a few minutes. The tension in my chest eased and the cool wind dried the sweat from my face. No, Jonesy, are you here? Hmm. Here, Sergeant. Did you hear the news? Every word. What did you see? Nothing, Sergeant. I can't see anything from my side. Did you see any peasants in the field? No, Sergeant. A glass? Yes, Sergeant. No. Did the General hit those gooks in the field? I think so. I saw them go down. Did they look like Viet Cong to you? They looked like peasants planting rice to me. That's what I told the jackass, but he wouldn't listen. Well, look what it cost him. Yeah. It's a mess. We'll be in big trouble when headquarters hears we lost old Rusty Gun and Colonel Clay. You can be sure they'll have us by the throat? It wasn't your fault, Sergeant, Jonesy said. You told him we were running low on fuel. You didn't want to make that run over the field. I heard you tell him they were just peasants. I heard you. No, so did I. I lied. And I heard you, the co-pilot added. Good. Just remember, everyone, when they start questioning us, especially you, Glass. You'll be especially questioned because you saw everything. I'll just tell you what happened. Don't let yourself be intimidated. Stay calm. I am calm, Sergeant. You said you heard the General screaming? I did. I heard nothing but gunshots because of the noise of the propellers. I see, I said. Why didn't you contact the intercom when you saw them fall out? It happened so fast, and then just at that time you were calling for the General. You've got me stunned, Glass. I still can't believe it. Neither can I. You old fool. What a ridiculous death. Suddenly I was hit over the head like a shoe. Until then, it had never occurred to me that a general or a colonel might still be lying alive in that rice paddy. Couldn't they have been left alive by the fall? We were flying pretty low. I could not refrain from voicing that possibility. Maybe he's still alive, Sergeant. The altitude wasn't very high, and the ground on the rice paddies isn't firm. No way, Glass. I've been thinking about it. We crossed the field at eighty feet. I thought we were going lower. No. If those gooks turned out to be Viet Cong with rifles, I wasn't going to give them a chance to penetrate our gearbox. It was a game for the general, but not for me. I even picked up the speed a little bit. Didn't you notice? I didn't want to put myself in harm's way for that son of a bitch. I'll tell you what, he's really screwed us. Hmm, so you think he crashed to his death? Do you know how fast a body falls? From eighty feet, the general hit the field at over sixty miles an hour. He probably couldn't have sustained such a blow. Anyway, we'll know soon enough. When headquarters gets the news, they must be sending a whole squadron after them. It's not every day you lose a general in this goddamn war, and a thug like him. By God, they'll eat us alive for that bastard. It wasn't our fault, Sergeant, said Jonesy. We were only following orders. Who would have thought this would happen? This is some kind of freak accident. That's what worries me. Who's gonna believe it's a freak accident? Damn that lousy soldier. Don't beat yourself up, said the copilot. We were only following orders. Yeah, right, said Sergeant Bright, regaining his confidence. Fuck them all to hell. Tell it like it is and stand your ground. Is that understood? Don't worry about us, Sergeant, Jonesy assured him. What a surprise they're in for, said Sergeant Bright. Shouldn't we radio headquarters and tell them what happened? The co-pilot asked. What do you think, Sergeant? That's the stupidest thing you could think of. Bright exploded. You can't say anything over the radio. There's no telling who might overhear us and spread the damn story around the world. 
We can't tell anyone but his staff officers, or we'll get mixed in the shit. Don't you know Rusty Gunn is the Pentagon's favourite? God damn it! I didn't think of that, Sergeant, said the copulot. All right, stop thinking and keep an eye on that damn gas gauge. The tank's almost empty. All we need is a forced landing in the jungle that would be a total 100% failure. Then we flew in silence and had enough gasoline to reach the base where we picked up the general in the morning. We were only in the air for four hours, but when we finally got out of the helicopter and headed for the command post tent, I thought it was the longest flight of my life. Only Jonesy was left at the helicopter, making sure it didn't get serviced. Sergeant Bright didn't want the helicopter refueled until his superiors were sure the gas tank was empty as we approached headquarters. I was sweating again from the growing tension. In this case, I rejoiced in the intense midday heat because the others were sweating too. As Sergeant Bright had foreseen, our superiors scolded us, but the interrogation was brief. At first, Gunn's staff were shocked by our report. Then they doubted Sergeant Bright's explanation and my story. Then they threatened an official investigation, and finally they tried to refute our testimony. All this came to naught. There were four of us, and we all confirmed the same thing, and they had no evidence to refute us unless they found the general or colonel alive. When Sergeant Bright raised this possibility, the interrogation at once ceased. Hitherto everyone had assumed that they were dead. Suddenly the search for the general and Colonel Clay, dead or alive, became a matter of paramount importance and feverish activity broke out in the command tent. Three helicopters, fully armed with six soldiers aboard each, were quickly prepared. Sergeant Bright was ordered to lead the helicopters to the scene. Three staff officers went with us. Two colonels and a major. Half an hour after our arrival at the base, including time to refuel the helicopter, after Sergeant Bright made sure and the staff officers confirmed that the fuel tank was empty, we were back in the air. The flight to the rice paddy took twelve long, agonizing minutes. We made a circle, descended to two hundred feet, and quickly discovered the bodies of three peasants. Another body was spotted a few hundred feet away from them towards the village. Sergeant Bright selected a patch of low grass field fifty meters away for landing, and we landed. Three other helicopters descended in a semicircle near us. We hurried to our find, accompanied by armed soldiers. Colonel Clay's body lay prostrate, face down. One of the staff officers turned it over. The colonel's skull was split from the top of his forehead to his chin. Looking at the shattered face, I thought I would have to send him home in a sealed coffin. The soldiers fan out across the field in search of the general. They found him about a 150 yards from the colonel's body, one of the soldiers shouting that the general was dead. We hurried over to them. General Gunn was lying on his back. His face, intact, was contorted with anger. I noticed that his hands were clenched into fists. I wondered if this last threatening gesture was directed against me or against the death that awaited him at the end of his fall. It didn't matter now. I only knew that he would be given high honours and buried as a hero. Another thing was three peasants dressed in black, lying dead in their rice paddy with their backs riddled with General Gunn's bullets. When the soldiers kicked them over on their backs and removed their conical straw hats, we saw the haggard, wrinkled faces of the three old women. After returning to division headquarters with the bodies of General Gunn and Colonel Clay, we were again immediately summoned by our superiors. This time not for interrogation. The picture of death in the rice field forced the superiors to turn their attention to other matters. One of the colonels spoke. He said, If the press learns that General Gunn mistakenly killed three peasant women, there will be a reckoning for all the chain of command. Everyone from the commander to the helicopter crew will be affected. Is that clear? It was clear. There was to be no talk of General Gunn's morning aerial reconnaissance. Understood? That was clear. The official announcement of General Gunn's death will be made by the commander of the troops in Saigon. The official report is everything you know about the incident. Is that clear? And that was clear. As for the logbook entry, we did not fly a mission that morning. A few hours after we arrived at division headquarters, the entry was expunged. By the time we return to their base, our commander will be instructed accordingly. Here the colonel looked at his watch. It will take me another hour to finalize this matter, then you can leave. That'll be 15.00. While you're waiting, you can grab a bite to eat. Any questions? My crew members shook their heads in the negative. But I had a question. What about my rifle, sir? One of the soldiers found it a few feet from the general's body, and the colonel took it with him. 
He thoughtfully held the rifle by the end of the barrel. We all noticed this, but it didn't bother me. I knew that after the inspection they would find the general's fingerprints on the stock, barrel, and trigger. The colonel looked at me blankly. We'll keep it. You'll be issued a new weapon. I'll take care of it. Yes, sir. The colonel gave us a menacing look. One more thing, gentlemen. If any of you say one word to anyone about what happened today, they'll wish they were still alive. Is that clear? That was clear, too. All right, gentlemen, this incident is over. It was. By the time we got back to base, operations had already received instructions from divisional headquarters. Sergeant Bright handed our logbook personally to the base commander. No questions were asked. The next morning I was issued a new rifle without question. Two days after the event, Stars and Stripes placed a prominent notice of the General's death in Vietnam. During a routine flight into combat zones, his helicopter had been shot down by enemy ground fire in a remote area. No one survived, but all the bodies were removed. The names of the crew Kleps are being withheld until their families are notified. To my surprise, the article was accompanied by a photo of the helicopter wreckage in a rice paddy. Of course it was easy to fake a downed helicopter, but I wondered if the command would have to compose fake telegrams and send them out to the imaginary families of the imaginary crew members. Why not? Anything is possible in this ridiculous war. Anything. General Gunn's body was flown to the States, for burial in Arlington Cemetery, with all the military honours due a hero of the Republic. A brief obituary was published describing the general's career, and the usual celebrity quotes extolling the devotion of America's most brilliant combat general in Vietnam. One hawkish senator called him a God-sent general in the fight for freedom, and the president sank. He died as he lived, serving his country. Amen. I put the paper down, relieved to breathe in the hot, humid Vietnamese air and smoked pot. I had managed to get off the hook. Amen. That was the end of my Vietnamese year as far as killing was concerned. Our helicopter crew was reassigned to a medical evacuation unit, and I spent 87 days of my military year transporting the wounded and killed from the combat area to a field hospital. It was gut-wrenching work, and I stayed on the grass the whole time. Without it, I would have gone insane listening to the screams and moans of the maimed, the blinded, the paralyzed. I could still hear the cries of the wounded boys begging to be shot. Only the dead were silent. Amen. On July 21, 1969, a year and a day after my arrival in Vietnam, I went home. Amen. Upon my return to the States, I was given a 60-day leave of absence before a new assignment to an Arizona base as a firearms training instructor. Soldiers go home on leave, but the only home I knew was Denver Asylum, and it didn't beckon me. I had no friends there or anywhere else. I wanted to try to find Blondi, but where to find him? Then there was the tall man. He must be home by now. I wanted to tell him how General Gunn died in Vietnam. He would have loved that. But where is he? I spent the first few days of my vacation hanging around the army base in San Diego. I didn't know what else to do with my time. Even though I hated the army, it was the only home I had. Finally, out of boredom, I went to a shelter in Denver. But even there, it was depressing. The only people on the staff I wanted to see the black cook, who loved children and the physical training instructor, who wanted to turn me into a professional baseball player, had quit. Only the principal remembered me. He was a kind man and treated me like a returning hero from the war. He was proud of my service in the war, and at a special assembly of the orphanage boys introduced me as a glorious American patriot who had fought for the ideals of our country. I was annoyed by his inordinate praise. And so when the boys asked me to tell some exciting stories from my military life, I said I couldn't talk about it. I was frustrated by the disappointment on their faces, so eager for the heroic. The orphanage was a foreign world to me, and after two days I fled. I went to the airport and looked at the schedule of departing planes. I had to fly somewhere for the remaining 55 days of my vacation. But where? There were overnight flights to Chicago and New York. I was attracted to both cities. They were big cities where I could get lost, just stay in oblivion until the army claimed me again. I finally decided to fly to New York. I chose New York because it was my parents' hometown town, a place where I had once lived. Perhaps I hoped to find something from my past there that would comfort me, but I found nothing. New York was a complete stranger to me, and I had no provision or protection from the army there. For the first time in my life I was completely on my own, and it frightened me. 
I took a room in the hotel of the Young Men's Christian Union. I slept all day. What a luxury not to get out of bed in the morning after a whole year's army drudgery, and hanging around the city in the evenings. I spent the early evening hours in the darkened halls of movie theatres and later in darkened bars. I met lonely night people. Alcoholics, pimps, prostitutes. Men who didn't want to go home and women who didn't want to go home alone. They were attracted to my uniform, and after finding out I was in Vietnam, they wanted to know everything about the war. I smoked pot and told them about the shootings and the ears and fingers and toes being cut off. They didn't believe me, but they were fascinated and asked me to keep going. I was cleansing my soul of all the atrocities I'd seen. They were revitalized. Have another drink for me, boy. Tell me more. I pulled marijuana and told them that I had fought beside the general and that he always got a sexual thrill before battle. This pleased them and amused them terribly. General Gunn must have been a hero on the woman's side too. Ha ha. Otherwise you can't break the enemy. Isn't that right, boy? Two weeks after I arrived in New York, a registered letter arrived from the director of the orphanage with a ridiculous telegram enclosed. I had previously written to him, explaining my sudden departure by a desire to visit the places where my childhood had passed. He answered me at once, expressing the hope that my search would be successful, and that, whatever happened, he wrote, there would always be room for me in the asylum when I needed it. I was touched by his kindness, and one night, smoking pot in my hotel room, I began writing him a letter of confession, recounting all the details of my Vietnam year. I never finished it. I couldn't shake his idea of a war hero, and he wouldn't have been able to comfort me anyway. He wasn't my father. My father was dead. After a long night filled with hallucinations, I woke up and destroyed the letter. I thought I was severing all ties to my past. I'm alone in the world and I need to come to terms with that. No one will understand me. No one will forgive me. That morning, for the first time since my childhood years, I cried for myself, for my loneliness, and then I felt relieved, as if I had vomited, as if the past was gone forever. From now on, my parents are dead, and I won't think about them. I'm an orphan, and I won't think about my year in Vietnam. That's a thing of the past. And I won't see that boy lying on the beach with his throat slit, nor Hammer, who shot the boy in the field, nor... The telegram, however, shattered my resolve to forget the past, delivered unopened in a letter from the principal, who expressed the hope that it contained good news. The telegram suddenly brought vividly to mind the trials of the Vietnam year. The telegram, as you know, was from the Secretary of Defense. It informed me that I had been awarded the Medal of Honor for Exceptional Valor in Combat. It stated as if I had destroyed a machine gun nest and killed four enemy soldiers while saving the life of an American patrol, etc., 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 etc. As I wrote at the beginning of my diary, I laughed out loud in response to this report. It was an astounding absurdity. I had been awarded the Medal of Honor. I was being invited with my family to the White House where the President would personally present the award, with my family. The laughter stuck in my throat. I smoked marijuana to calm myself down and took a long look at the telegram, Rereading every word. Private David Glass. Denver Boys Orphanage. Denver, Colorado. A long puff of marijuana, and I was already at the gates of the White House with my family, all the orphans of the Denver Orphanage. The proud director has them neatly lined up in their holiday clothes in two rows. The White House sentry, worriedly, reads the telegram. He has to check it with his superiors. Yes, everything is in order. You may come in with your family, but before you do, everyone must be searched for weapons. They take away peng tives and toy cowboy guns from boys. As Secretary of Defense, I am pleased to inform you that you have been awarded the Medal of Honor for... For killing Private Hammer. For killing Lieutenant Flynn and Corporals Wade and Hawley. For killing Colonel and General Gunn. For listening to the screams of the wounded and the silence of the slain for enduring crushed skulls, slit throats, severed fingers, severed ears. You showed unparalleled heroism in battle and, risking your life, uh, saved a patrol from death, destroyed a machine gun and four enemy soldiers. In recognition of your valor, the President invites you to arrive with your family at the White House at 10 o'clock on the morning of August 28 to receive your award. Dear Mr. Secretary of Attack, I received your telegram informing me that I have been awarded the Medal of Honor, and while I am stunned by this recognition of my humble service in Vietnam, I am also amazed and dismayed. 
astonished because your computer's clearly miscalculated in selecting a hero. Dismayed because I am a hero who does not meet your standards of behavior befitting a soldier. On the other hand, the computer designed to choose heroes is perhaps wiser than we are and has correctly chosen me for this honor. Therefore, I accept the honor and will be present with my extended family at the White House on the appointed day and hour. Your comrade in arms in the fight to legalize marijuana, Private David Glass. The telegraph operator at the Western Union office, smelling the sweet odor of marijuana, stared at me suspiciously before glancing at the handwritten form I had submitted, then grumbled angrily. You should type the text on a typewriter, not handwrite it. He looked at me through old-fashioned iron-rimmed glasses. The telegraph operator was elderly and hostile. My bad, I said, but if you don't recognize my handwriting, I'll rewrite it. He delved again into the telegram and read aloud. Passes to the Minister of Assault. He looked at me. You mean Secretary of Defense, don't you? No, you read it right. I grinned, but he wasn't amused. Read on, I said. He continued to read the telegram to himself, tracing the lines with his finger and moving his lips. When he had read half of it, he looked at me angrily again. You must not use obscene words in a telegram. What obscene words? Hey, swear words. Not eating. Did I use swear words? Don't fool me, boy. I don't want no trouble. I'm not causing any trouble. I only want to send a telegram. He jabbed his finger at the telegram. You can't write, Gibbard. It's against the law. It's a colloquial word. There's nothing sweary about it. Suddenly there was a flicker of consternation in his eyes as they slid from my face down the form. I realized he was looking to see if I was armed. I don't want any trouble. I just want to send this telegram to my boss at the Pentagon. Can we put lied instead of blabbed? I took one last drag on my cigarette, threw the butt on the floor and stomped it out. The old man's face blurred before my eyes. The drug was having a strong effect. The boy on the bank was looking at me with eyes full of terror. I lowered my heavy eyelids. The telegraph operator's voice came from far away, echoing off the walls. His tone was soft. You're stoned, son. You'd better go to your hotel and sleep it off. I'll be here tomorrow. I looked at him from under half-lidded eyelids. You don't believe me. Take a look at this. I rummaged in my breast pocket pulled out a crumpled Pentagon telegram, straightened it out, and laid it on the desk. As he read, other frightening images ran through my mind. I hadn't gotten high enough. The poor, simple-minded old man held out the telegram to me. It's a great honor, son. I don't know what's troubling you, but you shouldn't send a telegram like that. Go sleep it off, son. Come back tomorrow morning. I'll be here. We'll write it in proper language. All right, son? It's a deal. I took the telegram back and tried to stuff it in my pocket. He helped me. I saw him tear up my telegraph form. You can't say slurred. It's against the law, isn't it? He nodded. You didn't mean to say that. You're just tired. Yeah, I'm awfully tired. How do you know I'm staying at the Christians? Hey, that's where all the soldiers stay. They live there all the time. And send telegrams to the Pentagon. I asked, fighting fatigue. No, you go first. Most of them just ask their relatives to send money to live on. It's like they can't go home. This war is doing something to them. You know that? Yeah, I know that. No, come back tomorrow morning, son. We'll send a telegram properly, okay? All right, Pop. I smiled tiredly at him, and he smiled back with great relief. I went out and stumbled to my room, where I fell into a deep sleep without undressing. In the morning I awoke rested and hungry. After eating a hearty breakfast in a neighboring cafe, I went to the Western Union office. The old man was not there. In his place sat a young woman chewing gum. I printed a telegram and gave it to her. She read the telegram once, then another, counting the words. To the Secretary of Defense. Pentagon, Washington, D.C. I am overwhelmed by the unexpected recognition of my combat service. I will be attending the White House ceremony alone. I have no family. My vacation address is Sloan, HCMA, 34th Street, New York. Thank you. Honorable Private David Glass, U.S. Army. You were in Vietnam, right? No. Ha ha. Nurse, are you tough? Hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. An emergency telegram will cost six seventy-five. Overnight, two fifty. 
send the overnight one. I handed her a ten dollar piece of paper and she gave me change. The woman sat down at the teletype and began tapping out my answer. I watched for a minute, then interrupted her. No, tell me, where's that old man who was here last night? He's on the evening shift. He comes in at four. Would you do me a favor? Sure, if I can. When he comes in, show him my telegram. Will you? He'll understand. He will. I left her to finish typing the telegram and went out into the warm summer morning. I was both disappointed and relieved. How do I explain accepting the honor bestowed upon me by the White House? It is quite simple. Before sending this morning's telegram, I had pondered several venomous replies, though none so offensive as the pot-influenced one the old telegraph operator refused to send. There has been a mistake in your information. I did not destroy an enemy machine gun or kill four soldiers. Perhaps that credit belongs to another private David Glass on your rolls, and I cannot accept this award. I ask that you reconsider presenting this high honor. I don't recall being involved in the episode you cited. I am not your war hero. I don't believe in your war. I cannot. I reread the Pentagon telegram again, and my anger subsided. After all, I was attracted and excited by its sheer ridiculousness and by the possibility of meeting the president. After all, he is the man primarily responsible for this year of my life. I saw myself as a victim of inevitability, and with that feeling I went to the White House. The Pentagon had organized the ceremony perfectly. On the morning of August 28, a military plane flew me to Washington. A protocol officer was already waiting at the airfield, and a limousine took me to the White House. We arrived at 9.45, 15 minutes before the ceremony scheduled to begin in the Rose Garden, weather permitting. The hot weather did permit. It couldn't compare to the stifling heat of Vietnam, but in my dress uniform, buttoned all the way up, I was sweating profusely. A group of reporters, photographers, and television cameramen greeted us at the White House entrance. I squinted at the camera flashes, while an officer politely deflected their questions to me. Gentlemen, he said smiling, you will have time for photos and interviews at the Rose Garden ceremony. Have patience. You'll get your hero shot with the President. He glanced at his hand watch in exactly twelve minutes. Better take your seats in the Rose Garden. We're on a very tight schedule. They hurried away, and I was quickly escorted through the corridors of the White House and out into the Rose Garden, where several young men in uniform stood chatting with their families. They, too, had come to receive the Medal of Honor and greeted me with shy smiles. I wondered if they too had been chosen by mistake. I noticed a young woman standing off to the side, crying quietly. The widow of a hero, I decided, maybe the widow of Private Hammer or Corporal Doll, summoned to receive the award of her heroic husband, who didn't have to return from Vietnam with a rich collection of trophies, ears and fingers and toes, to adorn the walls of her TV room with. This is the head of a gorilla I killed in the Mekong Delta. I wonder if anyone brought a head with them. We were all standing in that beautiful rose garden. Rays of sunlight broke through the foliage, casting shadows and caressing the summer roses, while television cameras were set up to capture the arrival of the President of the United States. Soldiers and their families chatted merrily, while a widow wiped away tears and comforted her embarrassed little ones. I stood alone, finally abandoned by a troublesome officer, and watched the scene. The starched and pressed figure of the President appeared. He smiled welcomingly first at the members of the press, then at us heroes and our families. When he noticed the distraught widow, the smile disappeared from his face. The television cameras were pointed at her. The president bowed to her with a serious look, trying to express sympathy across the wide lawn that separated them. I suppressed a wild urge to laugh, and in that moment I realized why I was here. I intended to tell him the truth, the whole truth in front of those television cameras. As the president appeared, the ceremony began. Standing behind a cluster of microphones, he gave a brief speech on the heroism of our valiant young American defenders of in general, and then made special mention of the young men and women gathered here this morning who dared to risk their lives in battle against superior enemy forces. Pausing, he looked up from his prepared text and looked around at a row of heroes, four soldiers, a widow. I say dared to risk their lives. He continued looking at us sadly because these men responded to an inner voice of duty that neither the government nor the people could demand of them. I thank God that they survived their ordeal. 
His statement was interrupted by a heavy sigh from the widow, who quickly pressed her handkerchief to her mouth. The cameras instantly turned from the president to her. The president's face flushed, he tried to correct his mistake, but only made it worse. Now today, one award is given posthumously. A brave hero who died in the service of his country is represented by his courageous widow. These words elicited an anguish cry from the widow. The president turned sharply toward the cameramen and cast a menacing glance at them. The cameras were still pointed at the sobbing widow. I noticed that the president was shaken by this setback. Pulling himself together, he turned to the text again and hastily finished his speech. Nah. Today a grateful country awards its defenders with the highest military award. The Order of... The president quickly turned away from the microphones and approached the first honoree. Two aides jumped up to him with orders and certificates prepared for presentation. The cameras simultaneously turned to capture this procedure. After reading each certificate, the president would take a mitted order from an open case, hang it around the hero's neck, shake his hand, quietly congratulate him, and move on to the next. When the procession approached the widow, she listened stoically, read the commendation, and kept her composure as the president presented her with the medal in the case. I heard him say in a quiet voice, Hey, I am deeply sorry to have upset you. It was inconsiderate of me. Forgive Hmm. Thank you, sir, the widow whispered. Please accept the gratitude of the country. We are proud of your husband's supreme sacrifice and share your bereavement. No, thank you, sir. I notice you have the children with you. Would you join them in my office after the ceremony? I'd really like to meet them and talk to you. Oh, of course, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Now he stood directly in front of me, smiling calm, while one adjutant read a laughing certificate of my valour and another stood beside me with the order in his hands. I was the last of today's heroes. It suited my purpose and gave me a chance to speak to the President at the end of the ceremony. I waited patiently for him to place the decoration around my neck, give me a memorised smile, say congratulations, private glass, and extend his hand to me. I didn't shake it. I spoke quietly, so that only he and the adjutant could hear. I do not belong to your heroes, Mr. President. I consider your war dirty. The smile fell off the President's face. His hands dropped, and he nervously turned his head to the right, where a few yards away three men in dark suits, blue shirts, and black ties stood in a careless pose, uniformed civilians. I hadn't noticed them before, but now I realised at once that they were his secret service guards. At this slight sign of concern on the President's part, all three of them tensed and put their hands in their jacket pockets. I realised they were fumbling for their pistols. Their reflexive actions startled me. I felt the blood rush to my head. My legs trembled. Oh, my God, I was unarmed. They knew I was unarmed. What harm could I do to the President? My only weapon was my words. Noticing the alarm on my face, the President lightly but emphatically jerked his head in denial. The men in blue shirts stood with their legs spread, taut as springs. I could feel how tense they were. However, none of the people around them seemed to notice it. A few feet away from me, a widow was waving to her children, standing in a group of family members crowded around television cameras. Cameramen were busily filming the event. Correspondents with microphones and notepads waited for a moment to be interviewed. Their attention was drawn to the widow. She was the highlight of today's report. The whole ridiculous scene was entering my mind, like through a fog, when I heard the soft, sympathetic voice of the President. You're upset, son. I know what you've been through, I know the horrors of war. I understand how painful it is for you. But you did what you had to do for your own good and for the good of your country, God, I thought. He doesn't understand the point. As his words echoed in my head, I looked past him at the guards, impassive sentries, indifferent to everything going on around them, focused on their president and me. Their menacing gaze challenged me. I couldn't let them rob me of my star moment. I could hear the sound of my voice, flat, cold, as if I were a stranger. Yes, Mr. President, I acted for the good of my country, but I could never have done what you called me here to do. I came because I wanted to talk to you, to tell you the truth about your war. The President got angry. Hmm, calm down, son. Hmm, he said sharply. Don't do anything stupid. This is no place for discussion. His tone softened. I'll be glad to talk to you later. I'm very interested in what's troubling you. 
but I'll talk about that later. No, sir. I blurted out. Now. Now. Are you aware that General Gunn killed three Vietnamese women working in a rice paddy with his own hands? There was a flash of surprise on his face. Then his eyes narrowed and his thin lips stretched into a hard line. General Gunn was a brilliant commander, the very best. He had given his life for his country. General Gunn was a murderer. I lowered my voice. General Gunn even experienced sexual arousal when he killed Gooks. This message struck him like a sudden blow. He turned pale. I saw real fear in his eyes as he glanced at the adjutant, who reacted by grabbing his holstered pistol. That simple, meaningless gesture by the adjutant served as the detonator that led me to this fate. The president recoiled from me in panic, crossing his arms over his chest. At the same moment, the aide drew his gun and pointed it at me. My reaction was instinctive. I grasped the barrel and with a sharp movement I wrenched the gun from his hand. I cannot accurately reproduce the sequence of further events. Everything seemed to happen at the same time. I remember the guards rushing toward me with pistols in their hands. I heard the shouts and shrieks of many voices, then the distinct crack of a pistol shot, a sound so familiar to me. The sharp, sharp pain of the bullet pierced my stomach. I saw the president with his eyes bulging. I'll never forget the look of panicked fear on his face. He had fallen to his knees on the green lawn and pulled his head into his shoulders to protect himself. It was a pitiful figure, curled up in a ball like a fetus in its mother's womb. Then an adjutant appeared in front of me, coming at me, and my right hand struck my chest as I fired my pistol. I don't remember if any more shots were fired. I only heard wild screams and saw the men around me fall to the ground. I must have dropped the gun because I remember clutching my stomach with both hands. Then someone hit me hard with a fist in my teeth and I fell to my knees. A voice shouted, crazy bastard, and many hands grabbed me, pinned me to the ground and beat me. I felt my face pressed against the grass and then I must have passed out. When I came to, sirens were howling in my head. I was strapped to a stretcher swinging as we drove through the streets. Coloured lights flashed, a ball of fire burned in my stomach, gripping my chest. The pain made me wary. I looked into the sweaty black face of a medic in a white coat. At first I thought I was back in Vietnam in the medevac helicopter, but the white coat dispelled that impression. I felt the medic's fingers pushing a gauze swab into my abdomen, and I gritted my teeth in pain. What happened? I struggled to speak. He shifted his gaze from my stomach to my face and blinked in surprise. You tried to kill the president, kid. But you didn't. No, but you wounded his aid. How bad? Not like you. Just in the shoulder. He's ambulatory. I closed my eyes. The pain rolled through my body in endless waves. The medic's fingers pressed harder on my stomach. I grimaced in pain. Hey, how am I doing? You got a big hole in your stomach, kid. But you're conscious. That's good. If I can stop the bleeding and we can get to the hospital in time, you might live. Aimed under the pressure of his hands. It felt like he was counting the bones in my back. His voice came from far away. You poor bastard. Then the sirens subsided in my head and I fell back into unconsciousness. At the hospital, my life was saved so that I could stand trial for attempting to assassinate the President of the United States. Well, now you know why I'm sitting in a jail cell awaiting trial. Isn't that absurd? And it all happened because I just wanted to tell the President the truth. Yes, I shot the adjutant, but it was in self-defense. Here's what happened. The guards came at me all of a sudden. One of them shot me in the stomach, and the adjutant kept coming at me. I shot him in the shoulder just to stop him. I don't need to tell you how good a shot I am, that's all. You know what the people who were in the Rose Garden say. They say I threatened the President's life. Why did he bounce off me? Why did the aide point a gun at me? Why did I snatch the gun from him and shoot him when he rushed between me and the President? But I ask you, why would I want to kill the President in the Rose Garden of the White House in front of all the witnesses? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? A little fat man wearing half-glasses pushed up to the tip of his nose, entered my cell and climbed onto the hard chair against my bunk that the warden had brought. His feet did not reach the floor and he looked very comical. I pushed the typewriter table aside and sat comfortably on the bunk with my back against the wall. He looked at me through his glasses. I'm Dr. Wiley. He introduced himself, no longer looking comical. How do you spell that? W-A-Y-L-I. 
Are you justifying your last name? He didn't smile. Are you a court-appointed psychiatrist to examine me? That's right. No, to determine if I'm normal or abnormal. I just want to ask you a few questions. Go ahead, I grinned. Hmm, what's your name? David Glass is like glass, but I'm not so transparent. That didn't make him laugh. He took a small notebook and a gold pencil out of his pocket and wrote something down. What did you write down? I asked. He answered without hesity. The patient appears laughing and cheerful. No, thank you. But I'm not a sick man, doctor. I'm a prisoner. Hmm. Force of habit, he said. You are a prisoner. Do you know why you're here? There's nothing insidious about that question. I'm accused of trying to kill the president, and I'm perfectly healthy. When did you threaten the president's life? I met with the president in August. You don't remember what date. What is this, a memory test? It's just a pertinent question. August 28th. At what time? Shortly after ten o'clock in the morning. Where did the meeting take place? I was annoyed by the simplicity of his questions, but I kept answering. This in the Rose Garden of the White House, I said, and added, I was called there to receive the Medal of Honor. Hmm, what is the date today? October 16th. And where are you? I looked at him in amazement. What is this place? A, the lockdown unit at Lawton Prison in Maryland. I've lost my patience. I don't have to tell the doctor anything but my name, rank, and personal number. David Glass, Private United States Army. Personal number 76543U21. Easy to memorize, like everything else that happened to me in the army. I smiled again, he didn't. Do you consider me an Emmy? Let's say I don't consider you a friend. He didn't insist. You said you were awarded the Medal of Honor. Yes, sir. But I can't show you the Medal of Honor. It was on a ribbon, and they took it away with my shoelaces and my belt. I'm not allowed to have anything to bang on. I laughed. What do you find funny? I pointed to the typewriter. When I got here, I was allowed to use a typewriter. It didn't occur to them that it had a long enough ribbon in it to make a noose and hang myself, if that was my intention. But I only want to type. I hope you won't tell your superiors about this, or they'll take away my typewriter. You have my word. What do you write? Just something for lawyers, I lied. To make it easier for them to defend themselves in court. When's the trial? He went back to checking dates. I wonder how this man keeps track of time. It's supposed to start on November 23rd. That only leaves a month. Mo. No. Five weeks, I corrected him. During our conversation, he continued to make notes in his notebook, but I was no longer interested in them. Why did you try to kill the president? I didn't. You shot the adjutant when he covered the president with his body. Hmm, that's what the papers say. There are witnesses who will corroborate it. That's their version. What's yours? I can't tell you. Nase can't or won't. I don't want to. Why not? Because you wouldn't understand. Why don't you try? Maybe I'll understand. You've been appointed by the court to determine my mental state. The court wants me to be declared sane so I can be tried and convicted. I don't want to waste your time. I'm healthy and I didn't try to kill the president. And I'm ready to stand trial. You served in Vietnam? Yes. That's where I earned the Medal of Honor. What were your duties? I was a line soldier. Did you kill anyone? I did. Yes. Killed who? Enemies. How did you feel about it? This is East. Always. Always. Even the one that earned you the Medal of Honor? Yes. Why did you do it? It was my job. Was it your job to kill the president, too? Ah, the devious Dr. Wiley. But I didn't kill the president. But you tried, didn't you? You sound like a prosecutor, doctor. I didn't put the question right, he admitted. It's not my place to judge your guilt or innocence. That's for the court to decide. I'm only interested in your state of mind at the time. Hmm. Forgive me, doctor. A soldier does not give ammunition to the enemy. I then you still consider me an enemy? You were appointed by the court, and I consider the court my enemy. But I can only give my opinion as an expert, not the facts. It's the same thing, after all. 
I won't argue. Uh, thank you. But is there anything you want to tell me? No, but I want to ask you something. What is it? What's your opinion of my mental state? I can't answer that question. I chuckled. Mm, can't or won't. He put the gold pencil and notebook on his lap and smiled the briefest smile we'd had during our conversation, then shook his head. He slid off the chair and stood up, getting ready to leave. I stayed on the bunk and watched him. He lingered at the cell door as the sentry opened it. Maybe when I come in again you can tell me why you wanted to shoot the president. It might help you and I'd like to know. I shook my head but said nothing. He left and the sentry locked the cell door behind him. An hour after Dr. Wiley left, the sentry informed me that tonight and every night after lights out, at ten o'clock, my machine would be taken out of the cell and returned to me in the morning. When I asked why, he said the warden had ordered it so. Shortly before bedtime, I secretly took the spools of tape out of the machine and hid them under the mattress. When the sentry rolled the machine out of the cell, he was pleased with his accomplished task, and I was pleased with mine. It felt good to sleep with that lump of ribbons under the mattress. Dr. Wiley visited me one more time before the trial. I said nothing to him about the tapes. During the second conversation we touched on generally the same subjects, but with more hostility on my part. The results were the same, and I did not see him again until after he'd had testified before the court. Meanwhile, I was interviewed by a psychiatrist chosen by my attorneys to help the defense. They hoped he would learn more of what I had told them, and he did. But it had no effect on the course of events. Dr. Goodman was a very different man than Dr. Wiley. He was much younger, about 35 years old, no more, and not so aloof, not so formal. Within five minutes he seemed genuinely concerned about my plight. First he asked how my health was. Did I feel well? Had I slept well? What is the prison food like? Does imprisonment depress me? Do the guards treat me decently? At first his sympathetic approach alarmed me, but soon I responded to his cordial attitude and I was eager to talk to him. When he began to ask me about my childhood, no one had been interested in this until now. I answered eagerly. How old were you when your parents died in the airplane crash? Eleven. You were already a big boy. It must have been a terrible shock. Yes. How old was your father? Thirty-five. I found out much later at the orphanage. I thought he was much older, probably because you were so young yourself. Parents always seem so much older to children. I shook my head. No, I don't think that's the case. I looked at him. How old are you? No. Thirty-five. Nod looked older than you. I remember his face. He had a lot more wrinkles and his eyes were different, more tired. Do you understand me? Dr. Goodman nodded. You said that as a teenager he was in a concentration camp. Yes. Certainly those nightmarish experiences aged him. Yes, I think so. Thirty-five is quite a young age for a psychiatrist, isn't it? He smiled. Nte, quite old. Yes, I'm only twenty almost, but I feel much older. You've been through quite a lot, too. How do you know? I asked suspiciously. Well, he shrugged. You lost your parents, spent seven years in an orphanage, then a year in Vietnam. That must have been hard, and now you're here. Yeah, I'm here now. Would you like to tell me about it? Doesn't he start with a standard set of questions? What do you want to know? Anything you want to tell me. And the standard set of answers? No. Tell me about your time at the orphanage. The orphanage was fine. I don't think about it any more. Too much has happened to me since then. Seems like a lifetime ago. What do you remember? Vietnam. How was it? And what was bad? The killings. The murders you committed. What do you know about it? He calmly met my gaze. I know you got the Medal of Honor for it. Hmm. What else? Is there anything else? Did he sympathize with me? Or was he even more devious than Dr. Wiley? Nothing else. How did you feel when you killed those four Vietnamese? I looked at him curiously and it puzzled him. Why do you call them Vietnamese? I asked. Weren't they Vietnamese? They were Viet Cong, Duc, slant-eyed. He understood. Was that how you viewed them? I shook my head but answered nothing. 
They were human beings. They were. And you didn't want to kill them? He wasn't on the trail yet, but he was on the right track. Can he be trusted? I met his warm gaze and I felt like confessing. Would you understand? For the first time during the conversation, his gaze fell on the manuscript on the floor, then back to me. Mm, test me, he said. I didn't kill any Vietnamese, not civilians, not Viet Cong, not North Vietnamese soldiers. In the entire year I was there. He kept his cool. But you received the Medal of Honor for destroying a machine gun and four enemy soldiers. I read the report. It's a mistake. A stupid mistake. If there was such a thing, someone else did it and I got his Medal of Honor? He was shocked. Are you saying you didn't do what they say you did? Hmm, quite right. But it wasn't in the papers, he said. There was a look of disbelief on his face. No one bothered to check, I said. There was no reason for it. They believed I tried to kill the president, and now they're only interested in that murder. Poor, touching Dr. Goodman. He was still trying to be judicious and persisted with his questions. You went to the White House to receive an order you didn't deserve. I did. Why? No, fate. I shrugged. I wanted to tell the president what his dirty war had done to me and guys like me. How could I pass up an opportunity like that? And what exactly did you tell the president? What I did in Vietnam. It was an outright lie. Dr. Goodman looked at me seriously, and in his worried face I could see my father's confused, wrinkled face as he told me about the years in the concentration camp, the trials I didn't understand, and I confessed everything. I told him about my first patrol, how Sergeant Stone had slit a boy's throat and then been killed and beheaded. I told about Corporal Dole, who cut off a sniper's finger and led us like a man possessed through a hollow, and then got shot in the head by a cold-blooded Corporal Thomas. I told of Lieutenant Cauldron who chased me, and of Hammer who shot the boy and tried to kill me. And about how I killed Hammer, and then the Lieutenant, Wade and Holy. I told him about the massacre in that village, about the Verzil, about General Gunn and Colonel Clay. It all flooded out of me, and when I had finished I felt the relief that comes only when one wakes up from a terrible nightmare. Poor Dr. Goodman. My feverish confession shook him to the core. He could not understand it just as I could not understand my father's terrible confession. All he could do was to pursue his logical reasoning to its absurd end. But why did you try to kill the president? he asked. I didn't. I shot the adjutant to protect myself. Dr. Goodman became even more upset. Do your lawyers know what you've told me? he insisted. No, only you know. Are you saying that you're on trial for something you didn't do, not to something you did? To this I said nothing. We looked at each other seriously. He trembled as he rose from his chair and shook his head in sad bewilderment. I no longer saw in his face the tragic face of my father. I did not need to inquire about his decision regarding my mental health. Poor Dr. Goodman. My trial lasted three days. The attorneys, in spite of my protest, made a formal declaration of my innocence on the ground, that at the time of the crime I was allegedly in a darkened state and could not distinguish between right and wrong. Two guards and an adjutant with his arm in a sling testified that I had aimed at the president and the adjutant had jumped to block him and was wounded. A television movie showing the moment I fired the gun was introduced into evidence. The prosecution prepared to call many more witnesses to corroborate the testimony of the guards and the adjutant, but the defense felt it was unnecessary to hear the testimony of other eyewitnesses to save the trial time. Dr. Wiley testified that in his opinion I was mentally sound and capable of distinguishing right from wrong at the time of the shooting. Under cross-examination, he admitted that he did not know why I tried to kill the president. Dr. Goodman, the only witness for the defense, testified that at the time of the criminal act I was insane and unable to distinguish between right and wrong. Under cross-examination, he stated that he understood why I wanted to kill the president but could not support his judgment with fact. I saw him nervously clench and unclench his hands during his testimony. Poor Dr. Goodman. My attorneys objected to my testimony. I did not object. No one called the president to testify. In his instructions to the jury, the judge said that the conflicting testimony of the psychiatrists was based on opinion, not fact, and recommended that it be disregarded in reaching a verdict. After an hour of deliberation, 
the jury found the defendant guilty of attempting to assassinate the President of the United States. My attorneys immediately asked for leniency, given my year of combat service in Vietnam and my Medal of Honor award for valor in defense of the people and principles of the country. Now I await the court's verdict. At first I worried about what the verdict would be. Now I care about nothing. What does it matter, really?